Hi, I'm Matthew Appleby, editor at Horticulture Week, and I'm here to chair the sustainability panel at Four Oaks today. So we've got David Denny from the HDA, we've got Vicky Nuttall from GEMA, we've got Tammy Woodhouse from GCA, and we have Steve Harper, who you might have seen on the previous panel from the Southern Trident and Responsible Sourcing Scheme. So, um, I reckon I write about peat more than almost anything else. Um, and it's all reached a kind of um, a hiatus just last week or week before when the government finally announced that it was going to ban retail peat in 2024. They were a bit vague on when the date is, but it appears to be the end of 2024, not the start, which is quite significant, um, though I don't think the government actually knows yet, um, which is the case in a lot of um, scenarios at the moment, I guess. Um, but it's the top of the list in our, when we poll our readers about what their policy concerns is, and that's growers and retailers and everyone else in horticulture. A massive concern because there's just so many unknowns about how to grow, grow things, about what customers want, will it work for, for the customers at the garden centres. So going back to Vicky, um, in terms of Pete and your members, are they ready to get out of peat by 2024 supplying garden centres? Are they ready? Well, they're going to have to be ready, aren't they? I don't think that's, that's not really an option. Um, but I think it's definitely going to be a challenge. Yeah. Um, I think it's a volume challenge to have enough suitable alternatives. Um, but there are alternatives coming through, like you know, Steve says, with, with, there's a lot of Koya-based products coming through. Um, but I think, you know, it's... It's, it's proving, it's proving that these things work and educating the consumer. I think we've got a big education piece that we need to do to inform them about the different alternatives and what that means they have to do, whether it's using more water or whether it's, it's the descriptions. I think, I think Mike's actually talked about this. It's not just about compost, it's about mulch, it's about soil improver, it's about all the different varieties of, you know, things. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's going to be a challenge, definitely. Challenge. But I think we, you know, it's no, it's not a massive surprise. I think it's just we were hoping that I think it was going to have a little bit more give in terms of the the time scale, but but it's it's got to be met. So yeah. Yeah. No, indeed. Tammy, what do you reckon from the retailer point of view? Will you be ready in 2024 to have no peat at all on this on the shelves? Um, as a business, we've almost gone peak free already this year, and we've done that um, because we took the decision to not uh, price promote any peat-based products. So anything we were running on a three for two was was peak free, and it's been really interesting because it just shows that people go buy on price, um, and the, and the peat passionate peat gardeners. Um, are happy to pick up a peat free product if it's on a three for two deal. So personally as a business we're ready but I think as Vicky says it, it's a volume challenge because once all the other retailers go peat free is there going to be enough material and, and, at, and at what cost to us as retailers and and as cus for customers. So um, I, think, I think people will move but it's about the price and availability of the product. No indeed I and mean, we did a lot of analysis of the uh, EPOS stats that we collect and peat has got, well, growing media has gone up two pounds a bag almost exactly in the last two years already and I guess that is because of replacements but various other reasons too. Um, Dave, what's, what's your point of view? Do you think the industry is ready? Uh, I'll reiterate the, uh, the point made earlier, um, no, DEFRA has published its position, the challenge is to get ready as, um, as quickly as possible. I mean, there's no doubt manufacturers have been kind of preparing for this. There's been a lot of innovation uh, that, you know, you know HTA, GCA have been working on helping retailers to, uh, to prime consumers and gardeners, because the last thing anyone wants is, you know, 25 million gardeners getting substandard results because they're not sure how to work with the material. Yeah. Um, I think the challenge is one of speed and complexity. Um, you know, it, it sounds really easy at face value to say in two years' time, we'll, we'll switch this out. But what that doesn't belie is the kind of supply chain sort of challenges. You know, availability is clearly an issue. But 
when you're dealing with multi-component mixes, the availability of those different materials is going to flex depending on different things. So again, how do you kind of uh, cope bringing all of that through the supply chain as a manufacturer? So I think it's uh, that complexity that um, is, is going to be one of the challenges in uh, getting ready for. Yeah. No, indeed. And Steve, you're very expert in this area. So tell us what's going to happen. I think the industry can achieve 2024. I think, to Vicky's point, I don't think we have much choice now regardless. Um, it's interesting because over the last few years, we've been a number of new entrants that have come into the market as peat free manufacturers. I mean, Southern Trident is an example, but there are others that have come into the market as well that understand that. The raw material is out there, but the other thing that we've got to address is price. Because when we're buying some of these other raw materials, if we're buying wood-based materials, we're competing with other industries. If we're buying coir, we're having to deal with worldwide economies and um, the cost of shipping. So there's, can we access enough raw material? Yes, we can. Can we access it at the same price we're currently paying now? Unlikely. Um, and that's one of the challenges that we've got to have as an industry in terms of how we bring the consumer along as the product that they're used to buying quite cheaply and it becomes more expensive. Um, given that steel consumers, whatever we do, and, and Tammy made the point, they're driven by price ultimately. And that, that's the issue that we've got. But I think the raw material is out there and I think a number of the industries can step up the amount of raw material they can access. No, great. I uh, just want to move on now. Um, green messaging in garden centres. This is about how to get the message across to the customer that you are green. And you know, a lot of the peat debate was led by NGOs, which kind of beat, you know, beat the industry. I mean, we, we've done surveys of the industry which says 80% of people want to keep peat, or they're not going to be able to. So the industry hasn't won that debate. Um, so the NGOs have got a louder voice than what the industry has, basically, if you, if you read that right. So if, if the NGOs say garden centres aren't green, then that's what people are hearing. So Tammy, how do you show the world that garden centres are really green and that the plants you grow, you're selling are? Well, I think the question is, are we, actually? Because um, I think we'd all agree we've got, we've got work to do. Um, and there's no point in greenwashing where we are now. I think this is about improvement and, and trying to move things forward rather than standing here claiming you know, we're the green industry. Um, I think we're, we're getting there and we're certainly working towards it. Um, I think also, yes, the, the NGOs have got loud voices, but a lot of our customers aren't necessarily listening to those voices. They're still coming to garden centres and they still, you know, want to garden. And, and I think my feeling is that garden centres, we need to be educating people and moving them along with us uh, rather than it being this big sort of knee-jerk reaction. So gently sort of encouraging people to change how they garden, um, change what they buy, um, and take people on that journey rather than it being this just sudden stop in selling things. Sounds pretty good to me. Does anyone else want to talk about green messaging to the public? Uh, I can pick that up and uh, sort of build on it. I think it comes back to providing solutions. So I think there's a difference between being loud on a single issue uh, but maybe not providing any of the solutions. And, that, and that's fine, it's not the NGO's job to provide solutions. But I think um, what a lot of the um, industry has is that we are providing solutions to the challenges of the next sort of decades. You know, we're looking at nature-based solutions, we're looking at the trees that provide the shade. And you know, there's a really, really positive story to tell. Now that absolutely does not um, serve as a kind of get out of jail free card in terms of our supply chain and operations. But I think uh, the consumers are you know, reasonably you know, um, what's, the right, what's the right word? I think, I think trusting and justifiably so of the local garden centre, of the garden brands out there, because you know, they've got a long track record of doing the right thing and uh, being seen to learn and improve. And so I think having that journey, having that sort of plan of action um, is the important thing. You know, no one is expecting perfection as of now, but I think that authenticity and that kind of courage to take the leaps and uh, to be able to show what you're doing transparently goes an awful long way. I, I, think, um, I think transparency is really important because I think there is a danger that the public get um, um, cynical about the word sustainable. You know, I think we have to be careful how we, how we present all the different initiatives. Um, you know, I think 
offsetting. You know, I think, I think the consumers are becoming more aware of what that means and actually they want more direct action rather than offsetting. So I think it's going to be harder going forward. But I think, like Dave says, we have got such a huge um, uh, to, uh, amount to offer. You know, I, I just did a quick list of what our members do in terms of the products that they offer. And, you know, there's so many products that are made out of recycled materials, whether it's recycled plastics, We've got recycled TV glass products for landscaping. We've got recycled tires being used. Um, so much natural fertilizer and you know di digester products coming through now. Um, a lot of eth ethically sourced products. Solar lighting. You know, I mean, it is solar at the end of the day. Um, FSC timber products. Um, fiber pots, irrigation systems. There's so much that we offer as an industry, and I think we perhaps forget about that sometimes, but. But it's very easy. I think any industry, you peel it back and it's not 100% sustainable and we have to do as much as we can and prove to the public that we are a sustainable green industry going forward. Excellent. Um, and Steve, you've got some... I think there's a couple of points. I think the responsible sourcing scheme is, is there about showing to the consumer how green we are as an industry. I think the whole point of the scheme now is it educates the consumer. The consumer can go on the website, they can see how... Um, responsibly sourced a growing media is. They can see the score of it, they can see what materials are being used in it. Um, and, I, and I think that open conversation with consumers is important. And we need to bring now the retailers on board to highlight things like that scheme to, to make it more visible. We've done a lot of work as a scheme with the HTA and the GCA over the last 12 months in terms of learning, learning modules for retailers and the retailer staff. Now we need to go out to the consumers and highlight that scheme to the consumers so the consumers can see very clearly what they need to do. As, as industry companies, we need to do what we can do. As Southern Trident, all of the raw materials we use are either byproducts or recycled products. We do not use any virgin materials in any of our products. So it's important then, again, as we take the, that responsible route forward. And I, I, with the responsible sourcing scheme, we've kind of got used to using the word responsible rather than sustainable, because sustainable can be questioned. But we try and be as responsible as we can, thinking well, if we're not using virgin materials and we're using byproducts, waste products, recycled products, that's got to be better for the environment in the long term. Excellent. Now, talking of recycled products, there's one big qu uh, more, more question I want to ask, which is about plastic. Do you think industry's sort of won the battle on plastic? Because two or three years ago, Blue Planet, David Attenborough, uh, anyone who used any plastic was completely demonised, but it seems like the industry has kind of, kind of been pretty successful in terms of messaging that it's moved on from using virgin plastic and, um, you know, grey pots, all that type of thing. It's not so much of a de debate anymore. Is that because of, because of COVID or, uh, you know, has the industry actually been successful in moving the dial on saying that we're not evil with plastics? Anybody wants to go for that one? Don't look at me. <laughs> uh, go on then. Um, I, I would say it comes back to it's an example of where the industry has provided not not just kind of one solution but many solutions to this. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the talk part is the classic one. So it is an example of the industry coming together, leading and moving away from that kind of that term, yeah, sort of black carbon pigment type solution. But equally, I think it's something that individual businesses have run up with. Um, across the, I mean, the example that springs to mind is. Um, the, uh, so I'm going to have to find ways to work in other companies as well, but you know, Evergreen, the innovations that they're doing around the uh, plastic um, compost bag recycling with retailers. Yep. So a you know, great solution to bring you know, plastic that would have gone to incineration back into the supply chain. Um, so I think it's those sorts of innovations and uh, being seen to be, uh, not, well, yes, being seen to be working on that, but actually having tangible results there that are bringing, uh, bringing the issue into focus is, is what's key there. Great, okay, Tammy. Uh, I personally think we've got a long way to go on this. So the talk pots are great, but for example, our local recycling plant still won't accept them. So although technically they'll go through and be recycled, they get thrown in, uh, not in landfill, but get incinerated. So still a lot more work to go. Um, I was out in Holland last week on the International Garden Centre Congress. Uh, and looking, they're looking at how we can improve circularity in plastics, for example, with standard um, plant trays that get re recycled through the whole horticultural industry. You just think about the number of plant trays that end up in bales 
um, and reuse is much better than recycling. So we've got to get to this full circularity in plastics. And Vicky and I have just been talking about how we can, you know, maybe as a whole industry, how do we push that forwards? Because it's great that Evergreen are looking at this, but that's not about the whole horticulture industry. So I just feel there's so much more we can do. No, no, indeed. I mean, the council thing is interesting. We asked 100 councils, sounds like family fortunes this, we asked 100 councils, do they recycle plant pots? And 88% said no. And then we asked them again a year later, and it had hardly changed. And I'd, you know, I don't think it's changed much since. But um, things have moved on in, in terms of the debate, maybe because of, of, of COVID, and a lot of people had to use plastic. And you know, we, we've been talking about other things now. I mean, it's interesting, the evergreen thing as well, because when I spoke to people at Glee about how effective that had been, they said, we've only had enough plastic so far to make one picnic table. But when the PR came out, it was three tonnes. So maybe it is about messaging. But that's got a big future ahead of it. Steve, what do you think? Uh, look, I think it's something that we can work on. I think it's like everything in life. We all need a bit of a nudge. And if we go back a few years ago when the whole plastic um, conversation was raised, as manufacturers, we went back to our bag suppliers and we started putting pressure on those guys. And very quickly, they managed to find 30% recycled content inside their bags, partly because we were pushing them and partly because that was what the government set as a target that we needed to have as recycled content. But now you have those conversations with those same bag suppliers and they're promising you 50% and higher kind of numbers. So as consumers are driving, in a way, things that we do anyway, we're driving our supply chain to improve what they're doing. I think the whole recycling thing, I was celebrated on LinkedIn um, last week about Dobby's and the Evergreen thing, because it's a great innovation. It's something that's been looked at in the past, but Evergreen have delivered it with Dobby's. But fundamentally, the problem comes from the council. Well, actually, the problem doesn't. The problem comes from the waste companies, because the councils can only recycle what the waste companies allow them to recycle. So whilst the waste companies won't recycle these kind of plastics at the moment because it's too complicated, um, we are then waiting for the councils to allow us to do it. We want to recycle this product. LDPE, which is what a compost bag is, is an easy product to recycle, but we need the waste companies to offer those services to the councils, and then they can offer it to us. And interestingly, it is clearly something that's of interest, because that LinkedIn post, I've had more people read that than any other LinkedIn post that I've ever published, um, when it's got into the whole debate about um, councils and waste companies. So I think the industry and consumers want to do the right thing, but everybody's waiting for somebody else to come up with a solution. Indeed. Now, Vicky, your yeah. last word on this one? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, we, we launched last year, we launched a plastic packaging pledge to encourage the members to reduce the amount of plastic packaging. But a lot of that was driven by the government with the plastic packaging tax. So obviously that helps as well. But like yeah. you say, there's a lot more you know, uh, more recycled content coming into packaging.